Now we have tons and tons of different types of records. You've already seen the start of authority record. This is going to be on page 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, uh, yeah, all the way to 74. So let's talk about the different types of records that we have in here. Uh, the first one we have is an SOA record. The SOA record has a serial number. In fact, let me show you my read writable SOA record. So here is my SOA. There we go. Here's my serial number. Now, if I wanted to force a zone transfer, especially if I had DNS notify, I'd say increment. Woo! There's a change. Oh, there's another change. Oh, look, there's another change. Woo! Every time I have a change, do I have to go in and hit the increment button? No. <laughs> it does it for you automatically, but it does change the serial number so that everybody knows, hey, my serial number is lower than your serial number. Please do an IXFR or do a zone transfer. Here's our primary server. Every domain controller that hosts this Active Directory Integrated Zone is a primary server, but the one where the zone was created is going to be listed as a primary. That's cool. Here's a responsible person. Notice it says hostmaster.zyx.com. Doesn't really mean anything. If you wanted to put documentation in here, you put your email address. Initially, that's what everybody did. You were required to do it so that if they wanted to ask you questions, hey, do you want to sell your zone? You know, I like that zyx.com name. Let's go ahead and buy that. They would email you. They'd spam you. Hey, you want some free servers, whatever. So you can put whatever you want in there, usually an email address. But be aware it is publicly available. You can do a request for an SOA record. Uh, the next one that we have is a refresh interval. Refresh interval is how often the name servers who don't hear from me come to get a change. And by default, 15 minutes, every 15 minutes. Hey, what's your serial number? Hey, what's your serial number? Hey, what's your serial number? You can increase that if you'd like. But what if I come up and I say, hey, what's your serial number? And I don't hear from you. I don't hear anything. The server's not answering. <gasps> oh! Then we go into what's called the retry interval. That's every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, I'm going to come back and I'm saying, oh, I'm getting kind of worried. What's your serial number? No response. 10 minutes later. Hey, what's your serial number? And in fact, I'm going to do that for an entire day. That's my expires after. Then, as a secondary, because they're the only ones that replicate on the start of authority, the secondary, after a day, will hang their head, say, I guess that zone is no longer a viable zone, and will delete it from their zones. If I'm a secondary and I haven't been able to get a hold of you for a day, all my secondaries go away. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you set up primaries and secondaries as opposed to Active Directory Integrated, because then they're all primaries, but if you have primaries and secondaries because you want fault tolerance, you have one day to fix that primary. You may want to bump it up a little bit. You may want to say, hey, uh, instead of uh, one day, one second, one minute, one hour, let's go with five days. So now I have five days to get that primary up before my secondary start forgetting about the zone. Very important. Now, of course, if you move it and the IP address changes and you forgot to tell the secondaries, they're going to be giving out the wrong information for <laughs> five days. Here is our minimum TTL, one hour. So when I give you a record, you're going to remember it for an hour. But one thing to remember, this is normally what you're going to do with new records. I create a brand new record by default, it's so going to memorize it for one hour. Does that mean after an hour it goes away from this database? No, I'm authoritative. I'm just saying when you do a resolve and I tell your DNS cache, here's the IP address, I'm also going to say, by the way, for the next hour, don't bother me for this record. Now this is, this is the minimum for the entire zone. But you can also have a TTL set up file by file. Every record has its own TTL. And if you want to have a different TTL, you can. And that's the start of authority record. And they talk about all this on 70 and 69 and all that. All right, let's talk about the next record, which is an NS record. Here's my NS record. That is a name server record that identifies who is authoritative for this zone. And notice that we go back into the properties, but it's actually stored in a text file on there. And it lists the fully qualified domain name and the IP address. That's all it is. It's an NS record. Here it is. That's where it's at. Just to add an NS record. Now, if I make a new one, let me make a new one. I'm not going to make a new SOA. We're going to make a new uh, NS record. So get out of the way. Beep. New records. What kind of record do you want? We want a new NS record. So I'll drop down, drop down, drop down, 
NS. In, hmm, I don't see an NS. Why don't I see an NS? Because it's an Active Directory Integrated Zone. It's an Active Directory Integrated Zone. It's set up by the properties of replication. Now, if I go in and I make a brand new zone, new zone, and we'll call this one, I'll make it a primary. We're not going to make it Active Directory Integrated. And we're going to call this one uh, Jelly Belly. Dot mill. <laughs> that way, the folks in Jelly Belly Factory, by the way, if you never had a Jelly Belly jelly bean, they rock. I went and toured their facilities in California. It's going to be called, it makes a file, jellybelly.mil.dns. And we'll talk about creating new files probably next session. So I'll say next. Um, no dynamic updates. We can't do secure dynamic because it's a primary zone. Say next. Say finish. Here's Jelly Belly. Notice we have one name server. I'll make another one. I'll say uh, new records. Should I disova? And we want to do a name server, an NS record. Hmm. How come I can't see it here? Because the interface can be a little confusing. And I've seen people that get lost in here going, ah, I can't make a new name record. This is how you do it. What you're going to do is you're going to bring up the properties of the zone. And the way that you add NS records is you go in and you select name servers and then just add them. For example, I can say server5.strmwind.com. And then I can resolve it. Or I can just put in the IP address of 131.67.5.8. And then it'll try and validate it. But if I don't even validate it, however, it doesn't care, it's still there in the, the name zone file. It's going to be in there. So even in an Active Directory integrated zone, if you wanted to force a secondary in there, you wanted to force it in, you got to do it off the properties of the zone. You just can't go in and say, hey, let's go ahead and make a new record. Uh, now we need an A record, a host record. We want uh, server5.jellybelly.mil. So I'll go in here and I'll right click. And I'll say new host record, A record. A or A, 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 A. What's A, 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 It's a quad. That's a IPv6 record. So we'll put in the name of the server. And we will say, uh, we can have a different domain if we want. But we're just going to go ahead and say, this is going to be server 15. And notice that it puts in the fully qualified domain name, server15.jellybelly.mil. Put in the IP address. 131.67.89.09, no leading zeros. We can also create a PTR record if we want, but I'm not going to. And I can do another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. This is designed for you to do a whole bunch of them, even though, eh, this sucks. What I would do is I would do it in a text file. So we have server 15. It is an A record. Now, this A record kind of illustrates that they didn't plan on the internet getting all that big. Because they said, well, we, we need a name to an IP address. Well, what, what, what are we going to call this record? Hey, why don't we just say A? It's the first letter of the alphabet. That would be great. And that's what they did. It's called a host record. Why don't they call it an H record? Because they didn't think about that. They called it an A record because it's cool. You know, These are engineers sitting at a bar writing this stuff down on a cocktail napkin, maybe. I don't know. It wasn't there. But that also leads us into a problem. We need to have an alias record. Like dub dub dub, you know dub 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 dot Microsoft dot com. That is not the name of the server. You don't have a server on Microsoft called dub dub dub. You don't. You have a canonical name record, a C name record, that points to an A record or points to just an IP address that matches it out. Let me show you. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say I want a brand new C name record. Okay, what do you want to call this C name record? We're going to say that it is dub dub dub. And notice that it already populates fully qualified domain name, www.jellybelly.com. And I need to point it to a fully qualified domain name. Well, my jellybelly.mil isn't hosted on any of my servers. We have a GoDaddy server. And by the way, Stormwind isn't affiliated with GoDaddy. I just like them. They're cool. So what are we going to do? Well, we will put in the fully qualified domain name for that machine, which would be, I would say, webhost 
12.godaddy.com. I'll say OK. And now we have the alias that's set up for that. All right. Very, very cool. Makes it pretty easy. Let's do a PTR record. Now, what's a PTR record? Let's take it out the audience. We know what an A record is. We know what a C name record is. It's what an A record should have been. <laughs> they don't even call it a C record. It's a C name record. Um, we know what a NS record is, an SOA record. What is a PTR record? PTR records, as we know, are loved by DNA, DHCP servers. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, know what I mean? So what, what do we have, what information is stored in a PTR? There you go. All right, it is the IP address to name matching. Most of our A records are, hey, I know the name, I need the IP address. PTR records are, I have the IP address, I need to know the name. So we have to have what's called a reverse lookup zone. So here's my reverse lookup zone. Never had one, let's make a new one. I'll say new zone. I'll say next. And again, it's the normal new zone stuff. What are we going to do? We're going to make a primary. We're not going to store an active directory because we're just going to do this real quick. Oh, let me show you this. It's going to be an IPv4. I could also do IPv6. We're going to do an IPv4. And we put in the network ID. Remember, this is a whole zone file. And what we're going to do is we're going to say anything 10.2.0.0 actually 10.2.0, that's going to be the zone name that we're going to go with. So any records under 10.2.0 are going to go there. Notice that it automatically populates a reverse known, uh, reverse known name, <laughs> reverse zone name. It takes and puts the IP address backwards. Remember it was 10.2.0, so it says 0 .2 dot in address ARPA. IN hyphen ADDR dot ARPA. It used to be exam worthy because you had to create these own files based upon that name. Now, I mean, Microsoft can put whatever they want on the exam. They might test this, this is an easy question. But this is the default format of reverse lookup zones. So we'll do this reverse lookup zone. And we'll create a brand new file with the name. And we're not going to do dynamic updates. Sorry, DHCP server. I know you wanted to, but sorry. So then what I do is I will go in and I will create, here's my reverse lookup zone, I will create a pointer record. Notice it still has SOAs and it still has NS. Because my DNS server can host multiple zones. It's already hosting an Active Directory integrated zone called xyz.com. It's hosting a stub zone, and it's also hosting a primary zone. So let's go ahead and make a record here. I will go, in fact, let's do this. I'm going to go in here and do uh, zyx.com. I'm going to make a brand new A record. Ooh, how exciting. We're going to call this one uh, server 74. Server 74, put in the IP address. I want this IP address to be 10.2.0.15. 10.2.0.15. And I'm going to say create a PTR record. Now notice we also said allow any authenticated user to update it. This is off by default. Whoever, whatever machine puts it in here, here I'm putting it in manually, they're the ones that own the record. But here we're going to say allow anybody to update it if we wanted to. I'll just say add host. So now it's added. So here's our server 74. But we can also go into our reverse lookup zone and eventually what's going to happen is, is it's going to populate the PTR record. This is an XML interface. Sometimes it takes it a minute to update. That's all. But that's where these records will go. I could also go in and I could just make them directly, where I'd say 10.2.0. We'll say 34. Put in the fully qualified host name, and we'll just use this one here. Oh, it says that's not the right IP address. So I can just pick it. I'll just put in an IP address. Put in a host name. We'll say server15.jelly.com. -E -E and what it does is it's really saying, OK, what machine do I forward it to? It's a pointer to server15.jellybelly.com. Well, I don't even have jellybelly.com. Ooh. You mean I can host reverse lookup zones for domains that I don't even have? Yeah. Just put the record in. You can go ahead and do that. All right, let's look at I MX records, mail exchangers. An MX record is a record used to locate an email server. For example, let's say that you wanted to send me email 
to doug.bassett at stormwind.com. Doug.bassett is not the name of a server. Well, it's my name. But we need to find a server that's responsible for the email for doug.bassett, and that is an MX record. So one of the easiest ways, of course, is to go into NSLOOKUP, and I can say set type to equal MX, and then I say storm.com, and what it does, it says, oh, email to stormwind.com goes to mail.stormwind.com. Here's the IP address. So it just did a quick little lookup. How would I make that record? Well, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> just right click and say I want a new exchange record. I click on it. We put in the host or child domain if I would like, and I'm going to say this is going to be server 15.mailhosting.com. So it doesn't even have to be the same uh, area. However, notice that it will populate the fully qualified domain name. So then you're going to have to go in and edit it. So we'll just say server 15. Put in a fully qualified domain name of the mail server. We'll say server 15 dot mymailhost.com. See? So it'll still appear as server 15.zyx.com, but it's actually going to point it out to server 15.mymailhost.com. And then we also have a mail server priority. Mail server priority allows me to go through and I can say, um, let's say I have multiple servers. I have five different servers, but one's the primary mail server and everybody else is a backup. This happens to be a golf score. The lower the number, it's going to get the traffic. So I can have one that has a priority of 10. I can make another one that has a priority of 50, for example. And then what's going to happen is, is all the mail will go to the one with a priority of 10. And only if the one with a priority of 10 goes down will it go to the one with a priority of 50. So this is a golf score. So be aware of that. All right, our last record, in fact, our last topic, is an SRV record. We already have these. You typically don't have to make them. An SRV record is a service advertisement record. How do you know it's an SRV record? Because it starts off with an underscore. So this is a service location record. We'll go ahead and bring up this record, show you where the Global Catalog server is. And it shows us the domain that we have here, shows us a particular service that we're advertising. We're advertising Global Catalog. We're using the transmission control protocol, protocol, TCP protocol. We have a priority number, a weight, and a port number. The port number is very important because it tells me what service I address this query for. And it shows me who is doing it. Now, with the priority, the lowest priority is used first. And by default, every global catalog server is going to have a priority of zero, which means we're all important. We're all important. We're just individual little snowflakes. It just means that, hey, any global catalog server is just the same as any other global catalog server. But if you have preferences, just remember, golf score, lowest will always win. It won't do kind of a balance load balancing. If you wanted to do that, what you do is you do a weight. What a weight is, is it's going to go through and it's going to say, hey, we are going to balance it between multiple servers. Not going to have a higher weight and a lower weight. And then we start to actually give you a percentage of traffic as opposed to lowest always wins, which is what priority is. Then we have a port number. If you need to create a custom record, you can do that. For example, I have a VLMCS record that's up in here and I manually created that. And When you get into our apps class, we'll show you what this particular record is. But you can go in, you can specify the protocol, priority weight, port number, all that stuff. Makes it very, very easy for us.